Members, it is time for questions to the Minister of Finance, and we will start with listed questions. I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you. Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Agnew. Uh, the outcome of the Office of National Statistics review is expected shortly, and while the result may be anticipated, we must await the formal notification on the detail of the ONS rationale before responding. Any reclassification from the private to public sector will affect how the bodies are treated in the departmental budgets. Any new borrowing by the bodies would require capital to L, budget cover, and therefore place a significant pressure on already constrained resources. Uh, I'm working alongside the Communities Minister. In fact, we met at 10.30 this morning, and this was very high on the agenda. And our officials are ensuring that we are ready to respond to the ONS decision. I just add to that uh, for Mr. Agnew that we do expect that reclassification decision to go against us, as it were, uh, to, to rule that housing associations are, are, are public sector, but also we do expect a decision uh, before the end of the month. Mr. Agnew for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And obviously, yesterday, this chamber had a debate about the need to invest in housing. Um, my concern is that such a reclassification could seriously um, inflict damage on our ability to invest, in, in particularly in social housing. What, um, in his discussions with the Community Minister, what contingency plans do they, they hope to put in place? Uh, th thank you for, for, for that supplementary. Um, I, I share those concerns. I, I addressed last week. I addressed the finance directors of all the housing associations, and uh, you can be sure, Mr. Agnew, that they also uh, impressed upon me the urgency of getting this right. I am content that we are on the right path. Uh, when this decision is issued, I will seek a derogation. Uh, the Treasury will take a decision on how they respond to that, based on the work that we have done. Uh, I am content that the work that we have done will, will uh, have the desired effect and we will get a derogation to allow us to put the proper uh, regulations or legislation in order. Uh, therefore, uh, Mr. Agnew is right to stress this issue, to be vigilant on, on this issue, but I hope and trust we are on the right path. And Mr. Given gave me much confidence in that regard this morning. Call Mr. Alex Maskey. Uh, just, uh, I mean, the Minister has already answered the question that he has, in fact, met. But the Minister for the Department of Communities, but could I ask the Minister, given his, uh, I suppose, in, in the context of, of an optimistic projection, uh, could the Minister uh, give the House assurance that he will continue to engage with the Minister for the Department of, of Communities to make sure that uh, the ramifications of the potential of this are minimised or not uh, reduced altogether? Yes, um, uh, I'll um, I think the member is right uh, again to, to stress how grave this issue is if we don't get it right. Uh, needs must in this case. Uh, if we were to lose the ability of housing associations to borrow uh, off, off balance book, it would cost the executive up to £100 million uh, pounds a year. We don't have that type of money, yet we are resolved to have very ambitious uh, social housing targets. So for that reason, uh, I take on board uh, the concern of the members, uh, and I am again heartened by the response of uh, Minister Given and his team this morning. Call Ms. Emma Pagali. Question number two. <clears throat> I have had a number of discussions with both the Chief Secretary to the Treasury and the British Chancellor, Mr Hammond, on the EU referendum and its implications for the Executive's budget. In addition, I have corresponded with them on a number of occasions on issues including the implications arising uh, from the EU referendum. I continue to press for early engagement on the budget implications in advance of the Chancellor's autumn statement on November 23rd. And I'm pleased to say the Chief Secretary of the Treasury has agreed to meet on the 24th of October, which I think is a Monday. Uh, and shortly before that, we will be meeting with uh, Mr. Hammond and I believe Theresa May. Um, I agree with you that it's essential that we have a clear uh, path of communication with the Treasury on, on all these issues, especially in this period of uncertainty. Um, my officials are in touch with the Treasury on a daily basis. Um, I think it's fair to say that our meeting uh, our weekly meeting on EU issues this morning, that my officials believe there isn't enough information coming back from Westminster and coming back from the Treasury. Uh, but I, I, I think we can take some solace from the fact that in Westminster, opposition parties are saying the same, that they aren't getting as much information as they would like. But for our part, and my part, and our department's part, we will remain on the ball on this issue. 
Mrs. Little-Pulgheri for her uh, supplementary. I thank the Minister uh, for his answer. And I think he would share uh, my view that one-year budgets uh, should be avoided if at all possible. But we do acknowledge that sometimes that, that isn't possible. But I would ask the Minister, and I've raised this with him already, but to take into consideration particularly those in the third sector, the many, many thousands of community organisations and others that rely on grant funding. And I know for them in particular, a short-term one-year budget can be particularly tough, especially when they've got contracts and other things to extend and bills coming in. So I would ask the Minister to continue to engage with the Department of the Communities and give a commitment to this House that he will try to get information out to them as, as soon as possible in this financial year to enable them to plan for the next financial year if it is a one-year budget. Well, uh, th thank you for that supplementary, and, and, and of course you, you, you met me this morning as chair of the committee and made those points. Um, I'm very cognizant of the pressures, especially on, on, on those at the front line of providing services. Um, uh, it's not a decision we took lightly in term of, terms of a one-year budget. I'm pleased that our, that our Celtic cousins in Edinburgh and Cardiff are following the same route, and I think that's because there is no alternative. Uh, in, in so much as we don't know what the autumn statement will bring. We don't know what it will bring in terms of corporation tax. We don't know what it will bring perhaps in, in terms of this entire fiscal reset and, and other issues. But I do take that on board. Uh, we won't know the full extent of the impact of the autumn statement 20, 23rd November. It'll probably take us a week, two weeks to assess that, prepare a budget. But before Christmas, we should have that a one-year budget on the source, four-year budget in capital ready. Um, I, I would hope and trust that we can get the information uh, to the bodies who need it as soon as possible. And I take on board the broader point. Stability around budgets would be uh, a great boon to all of us. And I hope we can return to the House in a more stable time and say, here's a budget which will bring us right up to 2020 in terms of resource. Thank you. <coughs> well, Mrs. Naomi Long. Number three, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with your uh, permission, uh, uh, Corley, I'd like to group questions three and four uh, together. Uh, a single uh, year resource Dell budget will allow additional time to plan for the fiscal adjustments that the British Chancellor is expected to set out in the autumn statement. It will also provide further opportunity for our departments to reflect upon resources in future years uh, that are required in future years to deliver the programme for government uh, priorities. Uh, I would say to, to, to Mrs Long, a multi-year capital budget is possible. I'm very pleased at that in light of the indications that there will be a degree of protection afforded to capital budget, budgets to encourage investment opportunities. A local multi-year capital budget will provide more certainty in planning capital projects. Uh, the First and Deputy First Ministers have written expressing their support for this approach to the budget, and the indications from other ministers have also been positive, with an acknowledgement that in the circumstances this way forward is a pragmatic one. And while Mrs Long is focusing on uh, a one-year and multi-year budget, I think she would agree with me that another uh, pressure on us isn't only that we have to adopt this budget because of the circumstances and the lack of information and the uncertainty from Westminster, but of course we still face into the problem that between now and 2020 in terms of resource we have a 4.1% real terms cut and battling that and finding a way around that when we do have obligations in terms of pensions, contractual obligations in terms of pay, it's very difficult and will be challenging to us all, but I do believe that this is the correct way forward at this time. <coughs> Mrs. Long for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer, and obviously I do recognise that there is um, particular uncertainty. I just ask the Minister how he intends to ensure that the budget process um, at this point in the Assembly actually runs smoothly. It has been a process that has often been beset um, by delay, and obviously on a one-year budget that would have significant implications for those who are service providers um, if, you, uh, if you encounter delays when you're down, now down to a one-year budget. Um, so I'd like the Minister just to outline what discussions he's had with his executive colleagues in order to address any potential delays down the line. Well, well I thank Mrs Long for, for that supplementary. Um, I, I think the executive is united around the, the concept of a one-year budget because there is no alternative and our, our Welsh and, and, and Scottish friends came to the same conclusion. Um, the executive realises that we have to move with alacrity to move with some speed and pace at this time. There are bigger issues around the budget and the complications of budgets and the way we do budgets, which I would like to address in the time ahead. My officials will move out to do a consultation with all the relevant sectors, including the trade unions, the third sector, business sector, and so on. I think um, I can say to, to Mrs Long that the executive will be united around not only the concept of one-year resource 
for your capital, but also united around the concept uh, and commitment to make the budget process as swift as possible. I'm unhappy that we have to wait to December before we can bring forward a draft budget. I wish it were otherwise, but I do understand that given the fact that it will be very late in the year, we need to move at pace in the new year to get the budget uh, through the House. I'm confident, I'm confident we can do that. I call Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Uh, does the Minister not realise the sheer absurdity of the executive pushing through a one-year budget while at the same time trying to spin that they are, they are almost at the finishing line of agreeing a five-year programme for government? Well, well let's, let's see what the alternative is. <clears throat> if we were to agree with the Ulster Unionists that a one-year budget is the wrong way forward, we wouldn't be walking in lockstep with the devolved administrations of Scotland and Wales. And it has been my experience, and I've met the, my fellow ministers on several occasions now, that when we move uh, together, we speak with one voice when we speak for 10 million people, that uh, we make a be better impression on the Treasury and we make better decisions for our, for our people. The alternative would be to, as the Ulster Unionists wanted us to do, was to make a three-year budget, although we don't know what Mr Hammond will do in relation to corporation tax. Will he reduce it to 15 per cent? Will he keep it at, at current levels? We don't know what Mr Hammond will do in terms of his, previous, his predecessor's resolve to rate our budgets in 1920 and remove £150 million uh, from, from our budget. So all these uncertainties, actually when I meet the business community and I met uh, the CBI yesterday morning for, a, for a, an hour and a half's discussion, business people understand the prudent budget making uh, necessitates taking tough decisions, but decisions which are for the benefit of all our citizens. And in this situation, the wrong decision the reckless decision would have been to press ahead with a three-year resource budget before Mr. Hammond's statement or, after, or afterwards in that period of uncertainty. So for me, the programme for government uh, will be outcome-based. I'm confident, in fact, that the, the, the two processes will align. And this executive, regardless or, or, or irrelevant, it's irrelevant now to consider about mistakes which were made in the past by other administrations, but this executive, with an independent justice minister and with the DUP and Sinn Féin at the table, will make the right decisions for our people and will create a budget which will be able to set out our priorities and meet the aspirations of our people. <clears throat> Call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for his explanation so far. And we, we've already heard from uh, Mrs. Little Pengelly about the impact that this could have on the community and voluntary sector in terms of their ability to plan, in terms of the amount of time they're going to spend um, applying for, for budgets, on, applying for funding, funding on an annual basis, and the inefficiency of that, because 20 per cent of their time will be spent applying for the next year, rather than reducing that over a longer term. So when the minister describes this as the best way forward, is it it's the best way forward for whom? Well, I want to thank Mr. Agnew for that, but there's no, there's, there's no real logic to that at all. Um, the, the logic of your position is that if we had have brought forward the budget earlier or gone for a three-year, we would have faced in the massive uncertainties. We will not know until November 23rd what Mr. Hammond wishes to do or what he, what he means when he says he wants to uh, reset uh, the, uh, the fiscal system. He wants to reboot uh, the, the, his approach to public finances. We don't know what his approach is to the austerity agenda. And in that context, the only sensible way forward, the only prudent way forward, as was reflected in Scotland <coughs> and in Wales, is with a one-year budget. But I do believe that we will engage with all those who are in receipt of public funds at an early stage. I would ask my colleagues on the Finance Committee to bring forward by October their thoughts on the budget. But this is the overriding point, I would say to Mr Agnew. The important for me, uh, the priority issue is to provide all those who depend on government with the funds they need. And while we can never satisfy all demand, demand is, is uh, infinite, our resources are finite, I am going to endeavour with my colleagues across the way and with the Minister for Justice to try and ensure we can meet the maximum amount of requests from the public sector, from the third sector, from our services, from the, those who are providing uh, essential 
services to our community. I am going to endeavour to provide them with the money, the monies they need. So for me, Mr Agnew, that is where the focus should be. And I would urge the Finance Committee to look at this. What, where are their priorities? Where would they like money to be spent? And we have a year budget uh, to lay out in that regard. And I think that is the area where I will be working uh, full out to try and ensure that we can, we can have a budget which we are proud of, which delivers on the programme for government objectives, and more than that, delivers on our objective of a shared and prosperous society. Call Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Question five. I want to thank Mrs. Barton. Um, I, I met with Minister Noonan on the 22nd of June 2016. It was a positive introductory meeting where we discussed a broad range of important issues, including NAMA. Uh, the uh, exact detail of our conversations at all these meetings remain private. However, uh, Mrs. Barton will know uh, my position for some time has been there should be a commission of investigation uh, on an all-island basis into the uh, Project Eagle seal. Uh, but she will also be aware of the position of Mr. Noonan that uh, any wrongdoing happened outside uh, his uh, jurisdiction. Um, need needless to say, I can call you know that's not a that's a position which I don't, don't accept. Uh, since June, things have moved on rapidly. Uh, the latest disturbing revelations by Spotlight only served to underline the need for a full and thoroughgoing investigation of the NAMA service deal. Uh, the suggestion, in my view, that uh, these matters are relevant only to the North is not tenable, but I do look forward to tomorrow, uh, as, as Mrs. Barton will know, the Controller and Auditor General in the South of Ireland has prepared a report into this particular issue. He will issue that. It will be discussed by Mr. Noonan and his, executive, and his cabinet colleagues, and then we will we'll take it from there. Mrs. Barton, for her supplementary. Thank you very much for your answer. But, Minister, are you confident that proper due diligence was carried out on the appointment of Frank Cushenhan to the NAMA Northern Ireland Advisory Committee? Well, I thank Mrs. Barton for that. If she, if she has the time, and now you would need a lot of time for this, but if she wants to go back over the Finance Committee investigation into this matter, you will see that at the time we expressed uh, reservations about uh, many issues around the Project Eagle uh, seal deal preparation. Uh, I don't want to name individuals today. Uh, there will be enough of that, and it will probably happen at, at a higher court than this when it does happen. Uh, but if you read the conclusions of the report and of the investigation, I think we can stand over those, whatever our misgivings about the conduct of the investigation, we can stand over those. And one of them was that there are lessons to be learned. In my department, uh, we took those lessons on board. And where it is relevant and has been relevant to the Department of Finance, uh, we have resolved that those mistakes shouldn't be repeated again. And one of them, uh, Mrs. Barton, was and I, think the, I, I suspect that the Minister of Finance, Mr Noonan, in the South, and, and maybe the Taoiseach will, will touch on this tomorrow. This was the biggest ever property deal uh, since partition. And uh, uh, it, was, it was our view uh, across the, the, the table uh, in, the fin in the last Finance Committee that we didn't have on our side sufficient professionalism to gauge and to understand what was happening. And in time ahead, uh, if there were ever to be a sale of any asset of this uh, size, and I can't actually imagine there would be, but we need to make sure that government uh, has on its side those who understand exactly what is, what is going on. And that's one of the, one of the lessons that, that my, my department has, has taken on board. Call Mrs. Clare. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his question so far. In your previous answer, you referred to executive unity, and I think the public are united in wanting to understand what did happen in the run-up to this deal. Um, will the Minister raise this at the next executive uh, meeting with a view to getting a united executive uh, commitment to a full and clear, transparent inquiry on this issue? Well, um, I think the, the, the member heard my position on this issue, and it's not a new position that there should be an all Ireland inquiry, but if she was in the, uh, I, I don't know, was it the House yesterday or on the TV earlier this week, she knows what the position of the First Minister is, and they're not the same position. So, be, in my view, it would not be a, a sensible path uh, to try and uh, take an argument uh, in the public domain into the executive. But as Minister for Finance, I, I reiterate uh, what I have said to Southern ministers and to my colleagues here. 
that a commission of investigation is needed so that we understand what happened and that the mistakes don't happen again. And it has been my view for some time that the sales process was, uh, uh, was flawed uh, at its very core, uh, and that I think will come out in the report of the Controller and Auditor General. Uh, what we need to do uh, in the time ahead is ensure that those who can really uh, bring justice to bear on this matter and can really bring to book, to book those who are responsible for wrongdoing, uh, and in this case I think it's the Guardi, it's the NCA, it's the F FBI, it's the SEC, we need to make sure they have the information uh, that, that they can do their job. I remain hopeful. I don't know if the member was on the Finance Committee when we met the NCA. Uh, the information provided was confidential. You can be sure it didn't breach any of their own protocols. But everything the NCA promised us they would do, they have done. Uh, each stage, they, they outlined and roadmapped the stages of the investigation, uh, and they have delivered on that. Uh, so it's my hope that they do have uh, the evidence. I do believe there was wrongdoing. I don't want to speak with individuals, but I do hope they're able to use the evidence they have gathered to bring uh, to a higher court in this particular assembly those who are responsible uh, for, this, uh, for this scheme. Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank, thank you. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Just in relation to uh, and appreciate the committee's desire for the minister to step aside to allow this investigation to take, take place, uh, and that hasn't happened. But on the back of that, I'm just wanting to, to ask, in relation to the NCA's investigation, uh, would it be right? And uh, what is the minister's view of allowing that process to take place without political interference? I sort of thought you were going to ask me to set aside, and I know of all the people in here, you'd be the most disappointed if I did anything but step up, and step up was what I intend to do. Um, I, I did say, and, and this is the sort of thing you shouldn't say in politics because you're, you're putting some trust in an organisation out with this institution entirely, but I do have uh, faith in the NCA. They have delivered on the promises so far, and I do believe that they won't need and won't, won't brook any political interference in their affairs. Uh, but time will tell. Um, time will tell, Paul, if that, that is how uh, things emerge. But of course, there are other jurisdictions now involved as well, the Guardi and the FBI. Call Mr. David Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I must say I'm delighted to hear the Minister's support for the NCA, given the circumstances of its introduction here. Um, given the significant level of public concern in this community about a range of issues involving NAMA, and issues which are not just those for criminal investigation by the various agencies north and south. Given the potential difficulties of establishing an inquiry on a north-south basis, and given the lack of confidence the public would have in any inquiry conducted solely by this assembly or any of its committees, will the minister give a commitment to have a full independent inquiry in Northern Ireland if it is not possible to have one on a cross-border basis? Um, there, were, there was every given there except Paul given, I noticed. Uh, what I would say to, to the former minister is that what he would have said to me in similar circumstances, uh, unfortunately I don't control the uh, setting up of inquiries in this, uh, this jurisdiction. Perhaps the Assembly uh, may have the power to do that, perhaps the Executive may have, to do that, have the power to do that, or, or, or another form, or the Controller and Auditor, Auditor General. Um, I'm as keen as he is to get to the truth of what happened in the Project Eagle D. Um, much of the information we're getting has come from uh, sources outside of, of any official investigation, and I think we all have to, to, to uh, tip our caps to the, the journalism and, and the journalists who have been working on this issue in particular. Um, I wouldn't give up on the possibility of an all-island inquiry. I would like to see what Mr Noonan comes forward with tomorrow, and I'm sure Mr Ford would like to wait as well and to see what the Controller and Auditor General uh, points out his shortcomings. And we know there's been some speculation that, uh, that, that he or she will say there's a shortfall of two to three hundred million euro in the deal uh, because, of, or because it wasn't uh, carried out properly. Let's wait until that happens and that we see that report tomorrow. Let's see the response of the Minister, Minister Noonan and the Taoiseach and take it from there. I will stand firm in my position. There should be that inquiry. I, I, I support your position. But I wouldn't give up on the fact, uh, among the many givens, that the, any, any investigation, a commission investigation set up by the DAO, by the Taoiseach, or an individual appointed by the Taoiseach to scope it, scope it out, I wouldn't give up on the position that that person could have no influence or no ability to find out uh, the information that person needs north of the border. 
Call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, I totally accept, of course, that the Minister has no responsibility for what happened within his department before he was the Minister. But I'm no doubt he is concerned by the boasts from the Spotlight program from a gentleman while feathering his own nest that at that very time he had inf insider status within his department and the opportunity to influence decisions within that department. Has the minister been able to investigate at all whether the integrity of the department in that respect was breached and whether if in the breaching of that there would have had to be any staff complicity? Um, uh, Mr Ford wants me to take on new powers and, and Mr uh, Alistair wants me to be transported into the past. Um, let me tell Mr. Allister what I have done since my appointment in relation to the NAMA uh, Project Eagle deal. Um, I have been in touch with the NCA and asked for my, my own meeting uh, to make sure that, that uh, they have uh, the full cooperation of my department, that there's no other information they need, but also that I'm kept aware of how that is, that is proceeding. We also did a, an audit, a forensic audit, of all the information relating to NAMA, which was in our files. Uh, and we ensured that any additional information could be handed over to the committee. Uh, the authorities had all the information. We were able to hand over some additional information, Mr. Allister, without redactions. In my view, there were unimportant redactions previously. We were able to remove some of those. Very, very few redactions were retained, uh, mainly relating to, to uh, data protection issues. Um, and we did release the name of the third appointee, uh, excuse me, the third nominee by the former minister uh, to Minister Noonan for the NAMA Advisory Committee. I stand over the integrity of the 3,100 uh, staff in the Department of Finance. Uh, I believe that all, the, all those people, especially those who have been working on this issue, want to see the truth of the Project Eagle deal come out. And you can be assured that every member of my staff, like me, uh, will cooperate fully with any inquiry. And there will be no uh, hidden corners. There will be no information held back. That is what we have done, that's what I have done since my appointment, and I think we will continue that and my staff are equally committed to that end. Call Ms. Catherine Seeley. Kest ever a shell at a whole question six. Well uh, boil and place or let's call this and Kest Shaw occur. Uh, last year the statistics and research agency NISRA ran a consultation to assess what questions needed to be in the next census of respondents who expressed an opinion the vast majority indicated the need to have sexual identity data collected through the census. The NISRA response to the consultation was published in August, and research will now take place to test whether a sexual identity question could be included in the next census. Uh, this research will be completed by 2017-18, and NISRA will then publish uh, the results and make a recommendation. The census will be subject, uh, and this is, the, this is the part that everyone else here likes, uh, the census will be subject to the approval of the Assembly. Uh, uh, which will provide the opportunity for full legislative scrutiny. So I am minded to include a question on sexual identity, but of course in all matters related to the census we will need to buy in of the Assembly and, and the Executive. The uh, next Irish census is 2021. I suspect they may go in the same direction, um, but uh, at this stage I would be minded to include such a question on sexual identity. Ms. Seeley for her supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister if he has awareness of the few of our LGB and T groups um, in relation to having a sexual orientation question included in the census? Yes, I, met the, uh, I ask uh, the Minister to be response, his response uh, to be quick. They, they, they are supportive. I met many of the groups in the Rainbow Centre earlier this uh, year, uh, and they would like a question on sexual identity to be included in the census. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Daniel McCrossan. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far and for finally addressing the elephant in the room in relation to the NAMA scandal. Uh, the Minister has outlined that he is well aware of the many issues surrounding it, the BBC spotlight allegations concerning a £40,000 fee to Frank Cushnahan and the report by the Controller and Auditor General in the South that states that NAMA deal had irregularities and shortcomings. How confident is the Minister that we will finally get to the bottom of this scandal that has literally shocked and sickened every single person that is watching this chamber? 
Well, uh, I, I thank the member uh, for his uh, question. Um, but I'm not sure. I know there's a lot of people giving the Minister of Finance extra powers today uh, and relying on me to do things which I'm not empowered to do. What I would suggest instead is, uh, is to the member is, rather than ask what my confidence is, what is the confidence of the community, north and south, of the people of Ireland and those farther afield who are involved in this particular deal, that they get to the truth? Uh, and I think that we have to assume that people are confident if they have trust in government, if they have trust in the highest levels of business, uh, law, accountancy, I think they, they have to be confident that we will get to the, the bottom of this particular scheme. Because if we don't, uh, the, uh, the upshot of that would be we have let the people down. Uh, I personally am confident. Uh, and one of the reasons that, that I am confident is I see at every turn uh, people from all professions, not least from the political profession, but also from the, high rank, the, the, the highest ranks of business, of accountancy and of law, who think it's incumbent upon us that it's essential that we don't let them down in this. Uh, I would only say one other, one other thing to Mr McCrossan, and neither he nor I have seen the controller and Auditor General's report. But it would be my feeling at this stage that while I am very much in favour of an All-Ireland uh, Commission of Investigation, uh, that it will be down to the FBI, to the NCA, and the Guard, and the, and the, Gar and the Guardi, probably in that order also. But I do think it will be down to the law enforcement agencies to finally unravel and pull back the cloak which has surrounded the NAMA service deal. Mr. McCrossan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I again thank the Minister for his answer so far, and he has highlighted quite a lot about the public, the public having confidence. But is the Minister not concerned that following the revelations surrounding a former party colleague and the alleged coaching of a witness before the Assembly Finance Committee, that any investigation undertaken by this House may be compromised due to political involvement? And is he not also concerned over the allegations made linking him to the coaching of the witness uh, concerned? No. Um, um You've moved from having confidence in the Minister's uh, uh, opinions to being concerned about the Minister's uh, point of view uh, on these matters. Uh, let me assure uh, Mr McCrossan that when I come to work each morning, uh, when we face the issues of, of balancing the budget, of finding £4.6 billion pounds to fund the health service, for making sure that our schools uh, have, have the resources that they need to make sure that we are building according to our plans, the, the art galleries and the libraries and the community centres we need, that the issue of the NAMA revelations around Jimmy Bryson and Diane McCare very much, very much uh, low on my particular totem pole. Worth stating again, and I thank him for the opportunity to do this, that I had no involvement in, no knowledge, no knowledge of, uh, the, co the connections uh, and communications between Mr McKay another individual, uh, Mr. Bryson. I noticed that the uh, committee, um, and, and, and Mr. McCross is only here a short while, so he should try and keep his manners in the House. We will keep our manners with him. And he should, he should also note that while the committee has asked, uh, have I any uh, communication of any type that might shed light on that matter, I don't. I'm happy to have the opportunity to put that on the record. And let me just say one other thing. When I hear the party of Conal McDevitt come in here and lecture, lecture others about the ethics of politics, when I hear the party of Declan O'Boyle come in and lecture us on the, on the ethics of politics, uh, I don't be concerned because I have confidence in the people. I have confidence in the people and their ability to see behind party politics. And I have also confidence in the people and those who serve them to make sure that they will get the answers they deserve on this matter. Thank you. Well, Mr. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, much talk about what the public think about various things. There is a section of the public uh, minister who are concerned, uh, namely those who were uh, involved with the PSNI and justice in terms of equal pay. Can the minister outline? I mean, that was a question that didn't come from me in the previous session, so it didn't come up. But can the minister outline the position currently with the executive in relation to that body of people who are concerned about equal pay? Well, I, I thank the member for his question, and it leads to that really issue you never want to hear in politics, which is a moral obligation. And there is a belief among uh, many members here that there is a moral obligation that the equal pay settlement should have covered those who served uh, for, for the PSNI and the NIO. Um, 
moral obligations sometimes don't make it into budgets because we don't have the, all the resources we would like to have, as the member understands. It's my firm view that the responsibility uh, for this issue lies with the, uh, with the NIO and with the British Government. I have written to Mr Brokenshire, um, who is recently appointed to, to, to the position of Secretary of State, um, and I have asked him to pick up, uh, pick up his obligations in this matter. Uh, the individuals involved, I am sympathetic to their plight. I don't have the money in my budget, and I can't, I can't think where, who, who I would take it from uh, to, to serve uh, this particular cohort. But I do think that the NIO both has resources and has a moral obligation to resolve this issue. Mr. Clark, for a supplementary. I welcome the fact that the minister refers to a moral obligation, and I welcome the fact that he, he accepts there is a moral obligation. But given there was a paper prepared in 2015 that exited by the DUP, and that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere, can I ask the minister, or can I get reassurance from the minister, that he will redouble his efforts to make sure that that moral commitment is uh, released in terms of the NIO or whoever the paymaster might be, that these people can get justice in relation to the equal pay? Well, I'm happy to keep the, the, the member abreast of developments. Uh, Mr. Brokenshire hasn't responded uh, yet. I think he's only received uh, that particular letter from us. Uh, it may require uh, much persuasion or much pressure. The member has more uh, sitting members of uh, uh, another house than, than our party has, and I think they may have a role to play in this as well in terms of putting pressure on, on, on the Treasury and on Westminster. Call Ms. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister what progress has been made following the meeting that he and his colleagues had with Banbridge Chamber of Trade around the usage of the health centre for parking. You give an undertaking that day that you would investigate and, and further it, given the needs around parking. Well, I, I, want to, I, want to, I thought for a minute that the member was going to raise the, the, the facts issue of rates, which, which I, uh, uh, we're, we're always <laughs> troubled and concerned about. Um, I want to thank the member for, for being present with retailers from Banbridge Town uh, at a meeting in, in uh, uh, Gordon's chemist, I believe, outside the town some weeks back, and, and for the, for the, for the run-through of all the issues. The issue you highlight is that uh, a, a government asset, now redundant, is uh, not being used to provide some parking for the city centre. I have given a commitment to speak to the health minister in whose uh, estate that particular property sits. Um, I will come back to you as soon as possible. It will take joined-up government, and you know how challenging that is for us, but for a car park, to help the retail, re retailers at the centre of Palmbridge, I would like to think we can get this resolved. Thank you. Well, Ms. Lockhart for supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank the minister uh, for his response? But I suppose I I'm very keen that the traders would see that that this government is listening to their needs, and I'm wondering, can you give an undertaking around timescales? Because obviously Christmas is fast approaching, and I know that the traders will require this parking around, uh, around Christmas trading. Well, if I was to say that I was going to speak to the Health Minister today, that might indicate that I haven't spoken to her yet, so I want to be careful about that. Uh, but uh, I will make sure that today we talk to the Health Minister. Uh, the ball will be in her court. You'll be sure she'll bat it back, but I, but I do agree with you it needs resolved, and I, and I will try to get the result. Call Mrs. Emma Little Pingali. We've had a, a good example just this week of some toddler economics from the Ulster Unionist Party in relation to a triple our funding but lower our taxes cry to the British government. But on a more realistic basis, could the minister outline what engagement he has had with Her Majesty's Treasury in relation to the protection of our capital budget in the short term, but also an enhancement of that capital budget, particularly for infrastructure, in light of the additional funds coming back that would otherwise have gone to Europe post-Brexit and the benefit potentially to Northern Ireland from that? Well, um I thank the member for her question. For the Treasury to have had that level of engagement with me would mean they have been speaking to me more than any other devolved administration, more than they are speaking to the opposition, and probably more than they are speaking to each other, because every time I turn on the TV, Mrs May and Mr Davis and Mr Fox are, are arguing with each other, not to mention uh, Mr, Mr Boris Johnston. Um, but you can take it that uh, it's my, it's my uh, uh, contention that we the government can do two things. The British government can do two things to help. One, if there's going to be a fiscal reset in the autumn statement and a new approach in relation to austerity, I hope also there's additional investment in infrastructure. 
uh, there's a decent, uh, uh, decent investment in infrastructure. We won't get to the, the cloud cuckoo land of travelling infrastructure spend. Uh, I don't know which particular, uh, which particular portal that was going to be transported to Earth from, um, but we're never going to have the money to travel infrastructure spend as the Ulster Unionists uh, seem to want. But there could be a stimulus. There could be a stimulus from, from the actions of Mr Hammond uh, in, in the autumn. Additional to that, he could take his foot off the austerity pedal. He could say that look, we're not going to oblige you to have a 4.1% real term reduction between now and 2020. So he hasn't brought me into his confidence, regrettably, uh, but we will be keeping uh, the, the Treasury under pressure on those issues. Ms. Little Pangeli for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response and, and can the Minister give a commitment that he will work with his executive colleagues in relation to looking at uh, stimulus and, and encouraging and supporting uh, business and economic growth here. In particular, he will be aware that infrastructure projects do take, unfortunately, a considerable time in terms of what's referred to as a pipeline. It could be three, four or five years. And will he do everything in his part to ensure that resources and processes are fit for purpose to enable these projects to get shovel ready and ready to go when we do get that certainty from Her Majesty's Treasury? Well, in, in, my, in my discussions with, with the business community, and I've met, uh, I think, maybe 15, 16 different uh, business organisations and chambers of commerce and so on, there is a surprising amount of infrastructure projects which are ready to go. Um, perhaps not entirely aligned, perhaps not a, a, a full planning permission. But I, I find that when we, when we uh, meet, and I've been doing a series of meetings with, with my uh, ministerial colleagues, when we go to each department, there are actually projects sitting there that they had to hold back. Uh, and I would hope that uh, whether it's a stimulus of our own making, and we've started the, this conversation uh, with the, the executive round, could we create our own stimulus locally, or whether it's a, a stimulus as a Barnet consequential because of Mr Hammond's actions. I think there are a series of projects I would like to see realised. The South West College in Enniskillen, one of the most uh, uh, impressive visits that I've done since appointment as Minister is effectively ready to go, and I think that would be a great project. Belfast City Council has a number of cultural projects around close to the Ulster University. I'd like to see that happen. And then there are some smaller game-changing uh, projects, including on Calderland and West Belfast, which I would like to see happen as well. So if, if uh, and you know in your own constituency, there's a little pedestrian and cycle bridge over the, uh, uh, the Ligon. I don't, I don't want to encourage you in, in baiting the, never mind beating, but in baiting the Ulster Unionists. But as you know, a previous minister announced this cycle and pedestrian bridge, got full plan information, and then never built it. Uh, but I believe if we had a stimulus here of our own making, or as a consequence of a Barnet, uh, consequential decision by Mr. Hammond, that's the sort of project, and, and there's more than just that bridge over the lagging that we could bring forward swiftly. Call the Lord Morrow. Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, from previous statements that he has made, not only in this House, but on other occasions, uh, would I be quoting him right if I said that, as of yet, he is still not convinced of the merits of Brexit? And does he accept that he is much better to lead his department from where we are than where he would, rather than where he would like us to be? That is, we are leaving the European Union. Well, I admire your confidence. Confidence has been used a lot here. Um, the, the Buddhists have a great saying about living in the moment, so I always try and lead from the here and the now and, and live in the moment. The amazing thing to me is that, regardless of the certainty of Lord Morrow on this particular issue, uh, the Tories in London can't agree among themselves. Uh, Mr Davis said it was going to be a hard exit, hard border, Mrs May, the Prime Minister, had to correct him. Uh, Liam, Liam Fox is busy in, uh, insulting fat and lazy business people instead of preparing for the, the exit that you believe is coming. So I'm more a, a let's keep the options open, but at the same time, we have set up within the executive an interdepartmental group which is gathering information. And it's gathering it without political interference. It's gathering without uh, remain or leave having any influence or bias towards it. Uh, and what I would suggest to Lord Morrow is that uh, these matters will take some time to resolve, and uh, he and I are both would like to see a, a conclusion to this, which is in the interest of all our people. I'm a Remainer. Uh, he, he's a, he's a, I'll call you a Brexiteer, but he's certainly someone who supports Leave. And I think the facts will show, will, will come to the, to, come to the, 
the, the, the, the come clear as time moves on. But what I think he would agree with is let's get the facts independent of political uh, interference. Uh, let's collect them at the middle. Let the executive take cognizance, um, certainly, and let's all take decisions based on those facts. We don't have time for a supplementary. Uh, we now need to move on to questions to the Minister of Health.